dear okay hi 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 so sorry i wasn't able to join but then i'm not sure what time i'd be called away at work so i'll be watching it as much as i can good luck thank you thank you okay so thank we are live okay great so we are live but we can choose to behave uh, the way we want to <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so, this is supposed to be a conversation in a book club then right yeah yeah yeah, yeah yeah okay great hi everyone uh oh shit my video is on i really hate seeing my own face let me turn off my video okay <laughs> all right hello everyone and welcome to the first book club session uh with uh anchor inside uh at antel inside uh, i think a year ago we would like you know having very serious discussions about machine learning and ai and ethics and suddenly you know uh this year with everything turned around we said well why can't we talk about science fiction because that's actually what antel inside is about and so um i'm really glad that we really started off uh, with uh, with gautam's book uh, the wall um, i think gautam's very special for me personally because we started this year of our uh, project on privacy and engineering by hosting gautam in january and then of course the pandemic took over and now gautam's back again <laughs> with uh, you know with a sort of doing a second cameo over here so we're only going to see one side of gautam today which is a science fiction writer and he claims that that is his original self i'm not going to reveal more because there's a better person than me who's going to shepherd the session here today and and that's vijaya um i really want to thank vijaya for taking charge uh, vijaya is usually very um humble about herself but i'm sure you're going to see more of vijaya and the other panelists in the next few months as they shepherd this uh, book club and uh, and you know have more exciting discussions and sessions for you so vijaya i'm going to let you introduce yourself please don't be very humble and <laughs> uh, take over the proceedings from here and hope all of us have fun uh, those of you who are watching on youtube you can post your questions in the comment section we will take them here and then uh, vijaya can queue them up uh, as we go along the way uh, over to you vijaya Thank you, Zainab. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the inaugural session of the Antel Inside uh, Science Fiction Book Club, a reading and discussion of The Wall by Gautam Bhatia. Uh, first, to introduce myself, I'm Vijay Lakshmi. I have uh, uh, published a tiny little book called uh, Strangely Familiar Tales, and I write for Women's Web on uh, issues at the intersection of pop culture and feminism. And mostly, I'm just a very voracious reader. um a few things that i'd like to uh, everyone to keep in mind today before we begin is first to keep your mics on mute so that we can hear the panelists uh, clearly and uh, secondly uh, that uh, you know just keep typing your questions into the chat box as we progress because we will be having a q and a session later so uh, you know at that point of time i'll ask you to unmute yourself and you can ask uh, your questions um let me start by introducing our panelists uh, today uh, krishna uday shankar uh, tg shenoy and of course uh, gautam bhatia uh, krishna uday shankar is the author of the aryavarta chronicle series 3 immortal beast and the poetry collection <clears> on fiction <throat> she co-edited body boundaries the etiquette anthology of women's writing her work has also been published in many print and online anthologies such as magical women 24 flavors and lontar number no. 6 she was one of the nominees for the tata book first book award 2012 and the 2016 writer in residence at fort canning national park singapore all her books to date have been optioned for movies or web series krishna holds a phd in strategic management as well as an undergraduate degree in law apart from writing fiction she is also the author of two textbooks international business and asian perspective and global business today in addition to her writing she also currently leads uncommon ground a rohini nilekani philanthropies camp arbitration and mediation practice initiative all her books to date have been she is also the mother of three bookish canine children buzo zana and maya who ghost write her books tg shenoy is an sff enthusiast and a columnist and critic He's the writer of India's longest-running weekly SF column, New Worlds Weekly, for Factor Daily, and the Specfix column for Bangalore Mirror. He also curates the SF track for Bangalore Lit Fest. He has featured in podcasts such as the Tale Harate Kannada podcast and events such as Sri Lanka Comic Con 
to talk about SFF in general and Indian SF in particular. He hosts To Boldly Go, a fun SFF quiz every Saturday. He is also an advertising and marketing professional and is currently a consulting partner with Celsius 100 Consulting. And finally, the star of the day, Gautam Bhatia, the author of The Wall and senior editor at the award-winning Strange Horizons magazine. He blogs about books and poetry at an enduring romantic. His work is also included in the upcoming second volume of the Golang's Anthology of South Asian Science Fiction and Fantasy. His other not so secret identity is that of a lawyer, an expert in constitutional law who has worked on important contemporary constitutional cases. Uh, his writing on constitutional law has appeared on platforms such as Scroll, Outlook India, etc. He has also authored two books, Offend, Shock or Disturb, Free Speech Under the Indian Constitution, and The Transformative Constitution, A Radical Biography in Nine Acts. He would like you to know that the wall has nothing whatsoever to do with lawyering. Welcome, all of you. And um, Gautam, would you like to say anything before we begin? Oh, no, just, I, uh, I guess just, uh, I'm really grateful for the fact that the first book that the Antel Science Fiction Book Club is discussing um, is the wall, so I'm 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 extremely extremely honored and grateful. And it just strikes me that just yesterday I was I was watching uh, a, a future con, you know, a science fiction convention online, the South Asia the South Asia uh, session, and and the common lament that all the panelists had was that there exists no infrastructure to sustain science fiction writing in in India and, and South Asia, unlike in Western countries. And I think that magazines, cons, and book clubs. Um, are exactly the kind of infrastructure that will allow science fiction to happen and for the reading public to kind of come into being and, and find itself. So that's the, I think this is a wonderful um, beginning and, and I hope that the Antil Inside Science Fiction Book Club has a long life uh, going forward and that hopefully this will be a propitious beginning to, beginning to that long life. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Krishna, Shanoi, anything that you guys have to add before we begin? No, no, I mean, this, this is really a, a, a great uh, platform and I, I hope it takes off and more people come in because one of the common refrains that you hear is that, uh, you know, I don't, didn't know Indian sci-fi existed. Or, you know, are there books written in this genre and all of those things. So uh, given the fact that they are getting published and the publishers are not doing their bit, it then falls upon us as fans and readers, you know, or enthusiasts of the genre to do a bit and, uh, you know, and uh, something like the Antil uh, SF book club will go a long way. So in that sense, I would like to thank Antil Hasgik and Zainab for setting this up. But what better way to begin with uh, this? Wonderful. All right. Um, so just to get started, I'd like to start with you, Shanoi, uh, because you're such an encyclopedia on... Uh, all things uh, SFF. Um, now, India has always had a very rich tradition of SFF writing and storytelling. So it's not exactly new to us. But in recent times, there has been a lot of interest from domestic readers as well as international readers in uh, Indian SFF. Uh, so given that there is this surge, uh, would you say that this is a great time for the wall to be coming out? Uh, yes, I, I would say so. I mean, it's sort of right now SFF in India is sort of peaking and one hopes that this peak keeps going on and on. But to uh, come back to somebody who said in the comments that Indian SF has, you know, been there for a long time. Yes, it has been around for a long time. I mean, even if you accept the one school of thought that even, uh, uh, you know, uh, any sort of fantastic literature falls under this ambit, we've had, you know, years of, uh, of that genre. But even in the modern era, for example, there are lots of uh, stories in which uh, Indian F SFF has had landmarks. I mean, starting from uh, J.C. Bose's, you know, The Runaway Cyclone, which is the first uh, story anywhere in the world to uh, feature the literary use of the butterfly effect. Or uh, even if you take uh, the 1905 story by Begum Rukaya, you know, Sultana's Dream, yeah. which was probably among the first pieces of feminist SF uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, yeah. I mean, if you go by the, the, the Western histories, they'll tell you that it's 19, you know, 15 with Charlotte Gilman Herland, but Rokea's, uh, you know, uh, Ladyland came 10 years before that. So we've had a long history of that. And uh, so 
when I hear that, uh, you know, there's, there's no SF in India or there's no sci-fi being written in India, it's mostly a case of, I don't know about these books. That, that fundamentally, that's uh, where it comes from. But I have seen it changing over the past uh, three or four years. And, you know, uh, lots, I mean, uh, once upon a time, there will be like one stray book coming out every year, right? Uh, you know, for example, back when uh, Samit Basu uh, wrote Simokin Prophecies, which is the first uh, Indian fantasy novel in English, right? There was that one book. Then the next year, there was the second book in the trilogy. And uh, But in the past two or three years, there, there's been a sort of explosion, you know, be it in anthologies uh, or be it in the form of uh, novels, uh, so to speak. For example, uh, we had uh, The Magical Women, which is uh, an all-woman uh, feminist SF anthology, uh, uh, you know, edited by Sukanya Venkat uh, you know, yeah, Krishna is one of the authors on that. Uh, so that that's the cover right there. Go get it. It's, it's a it's, gorgeous book. <laughs> yeah, it, it, is. Luck, it is. It is. It is indeed a, a gorgeous book that spans the whole spectrum of uh, SF. By that I mean speculative fiction. You know, science fiction, fantasy, and horror. And you know, there's a lot of you know some humorous writing also uh, uh, thrown in. Uh, and then uh, a landmark also was of course uh, Golans, which is one of the oldest SF publishers in the world. Uh, deciding to have a South Asia uh, focused anthology and that was you know I still remember the book when it came out in that big yellow label and said Golans comes to India so you know as much as we would like to think that uh, hey there are no readers or there are no as a fans if somebody like a Golans is taking this uh, region seriously it means that the, the profile is uh, uh, rising uh, then of course uh, you know, uh, Beast came out again by uh, Krishna Uday Shankar recently. Um, uh, uh, Leila, you know, Prayag Akbar. So while yeah. many people would not consider it SF, I would consider it SF, uh, you know. That came out, created some waves, you know, sort of bridged the SF literary thing, got made into a Netflix documentary as well. Uh, I mean, Netflix series, I say doc, I mean... Yeah. Documentary slipped out because if you watch it, it sort of feels like a fictionalized documentary of what is happening. It doesn't feel like it's speculative enough. But yeah, so that so that happened. I mean, and uh, there was this anthology uh, called Strange World, Strange Times, uh, edited by Vinayak Verma, uh, which is, you know, uh, somehow it's getting slotted under children's book on the publisher's website uh, elsewhere. But I would say that it's for children of all ages and it actually features probably the first uh, Indian SF story of uh, which features Aadhaar. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's a story by Zach Oye and you know, it's set in uh, uh, Bangalore. Uh, to come to uh, this year itself, uh, we've had uh, Lavanya Lakshmi Narayan's uh, Analog Virtual and other uh, simulations of your future, which was uh, the first that was released in terms of uh, chronology, you know, just, just before the pandemic started. A nice... Uh, uh, you know, sort of near future uh, dystopian, if you can call it that, uh, uh, Bangalore, which has been rebranded as Apex City. The whole thing is set in, 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 in Bangalore and where the bell curve decides uh, everything. And so you have the haves and the have-nots and, you know, sort of a, a world of constant surveillance and uh, all of that. So that came out. Okay, there you go. Krishna is our official cover shower. So that, that's... <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm sitting right next that's to all my books. So. <laughs> uh, then there's another Bangalorean called uh, uh, Jay Prakash Satyamurti who writes in a genre or a sub-genre that isn't that often explored in India, which is weird fiction. So weird fiction and horror. So his new... Uh, he just brought out his new collection called... Uh, uh, Come Tomorrow and Other Tales of uh, Bangalore Terror. So, and old time Bangaloreans will recognize <laughs> what, what Come Tomorrow refers to. It refers to the Naleba Bhuta, you know, which had a lot of people in fear in the, uh, you know, uh, 90s, you know, this is a long time back. So, it, the title story is about the Come Tomorrow ghost and, you know, the whole Bangalore mythos, as he calls it. It is a nice mix of uh, uh, weird fiction and uh, horror. And, 
his other book also came out this year, which is called Strength of Water, which is a small uh, uh, no, uh, novelette or a, I mean, it's slightly bigger than a short story, smaller than a novel. I don't know, call it novelette or novellum or I don't know, whatever, whatever the <laughs> category for that is. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, then uh, just recently uh, uh, there was a bilingual anthology which was released called Avatar. It is, uh, you know, uh, the first Italian uh, English anthology of Indian SF, which was published. A uh, lot of original stories by uh, Anil Menon and S.B. Divya and all of those, which was published, uh, edited by Francesco Verso and Tarun Saint, who's the editor of the Golan's uh, SASF uh, series. Uh, of course, I, it would be remiss if it didn't mention the biggest SF release of the year, which is Samit Basu's Chosen Spirits. Mm -hmm. Right, I, it just sort of climbed up the chart. It was a was a bestseller. Krishna will now show the cover. I'm sure. <laughs> I, oh, wait, 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 wait. I, I have it here somewhere. It's yeah, it's there. It's there somewhere. It's, it's there in that pile that you see behind. Um, you know, uh, near future, set ten years. Uh, you know, just set ten years into the future, which talks about and uh, if you go by chosen spirits, we are currently living in the years that shall not be named. So you know, yeah. it sort of feels strangely familiar, but not, uh, but it's not dystopian. I mean, Samit Basu calls it anti-dystopian in the sense that yeah. however bad it gets in the book, that's perhaps the best, best case scenario as he sees it. And in a, uh, in perhaps what's a good recognition of uh, uh, SF being recognized. I mean, usually when you talk about, you know, literary awards, quote unquote, and not your Hugo's or Nebulas, which are meant for genre, uh, they usually ignore this side, uh, uh, you know, this genre. I mean, for me, science fiction is as valid a genre uh, as literary fiction. Uh, and, and that's been a long-standing grouse, but uh, Chosen Spirits made it to the long list of the JCB prize, which is, you know, the biggest in terms of uh, the prize money uh, for uh, a, a book uh, award in India. So that, that's, you know, sort of a nice high point uh, that's uh, recently happened. So this is as, and what I'm talking about are the books that have just been sort of Trad pub in English, right? Beyond this, yeah. if, you, if you sort of scratch the surface and go beneath it, there's a whole lot of good self-pub books. I mean, Sturgeon's Law applies there also, right? But that 10% that of the self-pub books, uh, and I've come across a few, they're, they're quite nice, right? Uh, it's all, uh, I mean, suffers from the usual issues of uh, non-editorial oversight and all of that but you know they, they, they're so good uh, and also uh, what I'm not mentioning is the whole wealth of uh, SF being written in regional uh, languages uh, Bengal uh, you know has a huge tradition of SF and they even have probably one of the only active SF only magazines called Kalpabiswa which is very active and they do translations and, you know, they have their own stalls in bookstores. Uh, Marathi uh, ha has uh, this thing. So it, it, given all of this, uh, the, uh, you know, the profile of Indian SF has been lifted um, and to just close it a bit, because I think people are getting impatient to talk about Gautam and the wall. Uh, uh, the people uh, like uh, Shiv Ram Das or Nibedita Sen, uh, model who are getting nominated for the Hugos and the Nebulas have sort of made even the Western publishers and readers sort of take note of uh, Indian SF. So, uh, which brings me to the point that you made, the wall couldn't have come at a better time. Uh, also because it's a different kind of SF. I mean, it's yeah. not uh, science fiction, it's not clearly fantasy, but sort of drop somewhere in the middle of what, you know, people would call slipstream, right? And it's, it's sort of uh, different in the sense that it's something like this is not being published in India, you know, in, with this kind of subject matter and this sort of this kind of ideas heavy book. So, yeah, yeah. that's my brief bio or <laughs> brief background of <laughs> the resurgence of Indian SF. Krishna, do you have anything to add to that? No, I'm just going to say the wall is a bloody good book and let's start talking about it. 
All right. Besides, I can't talk Shenoy uh, when it comes to <laughs> talking about the field. So that's it. <laughs> okay. Uh, where is Gautam, by the way? Is he still here? Okay. I think uh, we'll wait for Gautam. Meanwhile, I think Krishna, let's uh, talk to you about uh, the wall. Um, so the thing is that... Uh, talking about uh, this genre of writing. I mean, Ursula K. Le Guin in her note to the left hand of darkness has written about how science fiction is uh, not prescript, uh, is not uh, predictive as much as it is uh, descriptive. Yeah. And uh, you know how it's like a thought experiment. So uh, she says that the truth is a matter of the imagination. Now the wall, like uh, Shanoi said, doesn't exactly fit into any one genre of uh, this is, it's not exactly science fiction, it's not exactly fantasy, but it fits into the broader umbrella of speculative fiction and it has that thought experiment element uh, to it. So I'd like to know what you think is the um, thought experiment that is being done in the wall and what truths you think it is bringing to the fore. Wow, deep question. Um, I think in that sense, you know, uh, speaking to what Shinoi said, both about the resurgence of Indian sci-fi as well as uh, where the wall fits in, um, it, it, it's true what you're saying that, you know, the best speculative fiction is actually a mirror to reality. And in that sense, the wall has so many little things and big things I resonated with and, um, you know, completely was like, oh my God, this is so here and now. Um, the whole notion of, you know, I mean, uh, at least this is what I took away from it, you know, as a, a book is both what the writer intends and what the reader also takes away in that sense. So uh, to, to me, it was this whole question of, you know, the, 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 there were so many levels of it. There was the individual quest for something more, the whole quest for freedom to be juxtaposed against the need for societal balance and to what degree societal balances have to be um, traded off with societal inequalities. Um, so, you know, one could get into the broader issues like that. One, one, one could see reflections of the caste system. Um, and I mean, I don't know, what, I actually want to ask Gautam whether he intended this, the blue revolution. I love that, man. Is it what I think it is? Um, is sorry. Uh, yeah, no, I'm back. No, no, I was, uh, so I, I mean, um, if you're asking specifically about the blue revolution and the etymology of that, um, mm -hmm. so actually it's it's uh, that does not have a specific link um, link with with I think anything in in our world, it, it, our contemporary world, but it actually speaks to the the um, difficulties of of world building when you have mm. a semi closed system like in like in the wall, uh, because you have the system where you have this very high wall, nobody's gone beyond it, so you have to within that, what are the resources that need to exist um, for people to be able to survive, um, have to all be self-contained, right? So renewable and, and so on. So one of, one of the key questions that I was facing um, was in this kind of a closed system, what might status symbols look like? Mm -hmm. uh, because every human society needs those kinds of symbols um, and I remember that in history, blue paint was always something that that symbolized the power of the patron of that painter because blue paint was so hard mm. to, to source. Um, mm. You know, Vermeer and so on, all these painters. Um, and so that set me thinking and I found that there was a specific self-pollinating flower called the wood, the wood plant that was historically a source of, of blue paint. Um, and self-pollination was important because in this world, because there are no animals, there are no bees, so there can't be pollination in the normal course of things. So you had to have something that was self-pollinating. Wood was self-pollinating, wood was the source of blue color. And so that allowed a limited amount of blue pigment to become this status symbol in that world. And from there, the blue revolution that tried to equalize all of that. So it, it was basically the imperatives of, of, of rigorous world building that were woven into the actual story that together made you know, the, the blue revolution as a concept in that story. Uh, but it was mostly a product of just having to really think about, about world building, which I think is a central feature of, of you know, science fiction, spec fic, mm -hmm. wherever you go. 
No, I think I think it actually goes to the depth or the uh, fundamental truths of your world building that, you know, you come at it from one day and it still finds so much resonance in something else that you may not have intended altogether. And I think that actually speaks to the strength of it, the fundamental truths, because the moment I, I was like blue and blue revolution, I was like, Jai Bheem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it was like... Yeah. Two, two two days ago, two days ago in a, in a, in a socially distanced picnic, someone said, "Was it isn't isn't like isn't the blue revolution JB?" And I said, "Well, now that you say it, I mean, I'm not going to deny it, but no, my my thought process was something far more mundane and and rooted in like the necessity of of putting a coherent world together." So yeah. No, but yeah, like I said, I think that just speaks to the fundamental strengths of the world that you've created. Yeah. That it resonates with so many other things as well. Yeah, unintentional, but but I'm glad that, that it's happened. Go. <laughs> I mean, the the author may be speaking to us, but the author is dead too. It's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a good yeah. classic example of that happening here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like, let, let's forget Gautam wrote the book. Now we're just going to discuss the book. <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought so too, that there are so many things, uh, Krishna, like you say, that resonate into what is already happening in our world. And like, if you, like, if Gautam hadn't told us, even I would have thought that, you know, the blue revolution is uh, related to uh, the, uh, you know, caste struggles and things like that. And that does show up a lot, actually. I, mm -hmm. I thought the concept of that social law and, uh, you know, the... Uh, that that was amazing. Like I was like, this this is just really radical and it's awesome. But yeah, okay, moving on. Now, now that Gautam is back, um, Gautam, my question to you. Now there has been a lot of focus in uh, recent years about uh, you know the issues of representation and inclusion in um, uh, you know popular culture, especially in books as well. And there is a lot of push, especially for own voices uh, narratives. Now, given that context, uh, did you have any doubts at all about uh, writing a, a main character who was a queer woman? Yeah, that's that's a very very good question, and I you know, divide that I think into into two parts. Um, the first is the choice is the choice uh, you know uh, to do that, and the second is the the actual writing of it. I think that the uh, the issues that kind of arise are different um, in both. The first is the actual actual choice. Um, to, uh, for the protagonist to be a queer woman. Um, I think that Rick Riordan, basically, he put this really well. And, and um, he, what he said was that, look, the world's a diverse place, right? Um, so far, what's happened is that the writing has acted as if it's not, uh, right? And, and, and this is why uh, the protagonists of, you know, classic canon, science fiction canon, all these years, subject to, of course, there's always, always been a pushback, but the, the, what, what is now, what has come down to this is a dominant canon, right, has actually pretended as if the world was much narrower than it is, uh, which is why you have, you know, cisgendered, predominantly white men with, with white names, always playing the protagonist roles, you know, entrenching of gender binary, all of that, right? Um, and, and, and what Rick Jordan says is that's a much poorer view of the world um, because th that is actually what, what should be taken as, as being, you know, um, uncharacteristic because that is not what the actual world looks like. Um, and if you actually examine what, what the real world looks like, um, then a, a narrative um, that is closer to the fullness of its diversity is actually being truer to the real world um, uh, th than than the canon, which which acts as if the, you know half of or so much of it doesn't even exist. So I think that in in that sense, um, it's just a question. It's not even trying to be consciously representative or, or trying to achieve a represent a goal of representation, but just to acknowledge that that this is how diverse the world is, and your novel should reflect that diversity. Uh, so that's on on the issue of of the choice of of uh, you know uh, um, of making the not making the part of it was driven by the narrative concerns, but the protagonist being a queer woman. Um, the second issue, and I think here is where a lot of concerns come up, is the writing of it, right? Because the fact is that the way our world has shaped up, there are axes of privilege. Um, those axes of privilege have shaped experiences um, in very specific ways, and so even though we may want 
to to live in a world in which gender is not salient that's not the world we live in um and therefore it it follows that as a cis gender heterosexual man there are experiences along those axes that i don't have access to um and and therefore and 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 the kind of solution partial unsatisfactory but it is what it is devised and, and i don't know if this goes beyond science fiction but it, it's it's a, it's it's very big in science fiction is the idea of sensitivity reading uh, which is that when you have you know when you have narratives that involve characters whose lives are shaped on axes of privilege that you do not share then you ensure that what you're writing is read um by individuals who do share those the axes um and therefore to the extent that you are engaging in say uh objectification appropriation or are just being pure tone deaf um you are told that in no uncertain terms and then you are guided about what is going wrong um so that's what that's what, that's what uh, that's the process the wall went through um in in trying to ensure that that in the writing of those characters um th- th- there was to the extent it is possible to do so uh, to avoid um it coming across or being appropriative um you know or or just plain inaccurate or wrong to the extent mm-hmm. that it has succeeded or failed of course is something that 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 readers um will, will tell me uh, but but that's that yeah that is the two part answer to to this question okay okay i i actually would like to comment on the success of it um uh, you know because i i mean i can't comment on uh, the uh, uh, representation of uh, queerness because i don't have the lived experience to judge that but as a woman i found uh, you know a lot of these little little things that were very uh, relatable uh and uh, you know there's one particular incident that uh, really quite struck me from the book where uh, and i'll keep this vague to not make it a spoiler which is that there is one woman who's going off on an adventure and then another woman hands her a packet uh, you know consisting of uh, food water and most importantly sanitary napkins and she says that you know you need to have this with you because you don't know where you're going and what's going to happen and so uh, you know and that struck me because there's such a conspiracy of silence uh, in our culture about talking about menstruation so that when i saw it i myself did a double take like you know am i reading what i'm reading and then it was a really nice moment and it's also the kind of thing that uh, you know women do for each other on such a regular basis the nice moments of uh, sisterhood and it was very uh, relatable so i i really i just said that, that 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 specific that specific those specific three lines went through four drafts um before before it was finalized and and um and 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 it was read by multiple people to kind of um uh, just those three lines specifically so wow. uh, yeah that that's a, a i i was i was terrified about getting getting that wrong and and and, and even now i i still am so so um, <laughs> but i can say like uh, it, the benefit here is of having people who will tell you very bluntly you're getting it wrong um there was one scene that i in in the comments uh, some one of my readers you know said that this scene reads like a straight man is writing it uh, so it, it really makes you feel like very small when you read that comment but then you can go back to the drawing board and redo it so and and in the end it's better for it so so yeah. i think this is a great great thing that science fiction is kind of like you know this idea of sensitivity reads and making sure that that um, it's blunt and and clear the feedback to you absolutely absolutely and um, yeah i mean i think those sensitivity reads worked here quite a bit so i i will tell i, I will tell i will tell them i can't speak for all women but definitely worked for me yeah no but it's also credit to the larger story i mean how that that whole relationship to me i mean you know was sort of weaved in and you know it was part of uh, you know uh, sumer's uh, system and you know sumer's uh, you know it, it didn't feel out of place so credit to you there uh, gautam yeah again i mean it, this is I, i'm glad you you brought this up because um this was a big debate i had with 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 the person who you know really had a, a big role in in the shape of of this novel uh, and and my point was that look the gender roles and so on are a a products of specific material conditions um and so one thing that the book is trying to explore is that if the if those material conditions are not present so in this case there's no question of like 
tra people traveling long distances, you know, or or like physical strength being like you know just a determining factor in your in what you can you know do, and a host of other such conditions. Then you these kinds of of roles would never arise, and so gender would not be salient in that sense that it it won't exist in the same way. Um, and and um, and this person said that is correct. At the same time, you you can't presume that that um, that that the, the you're still writing in the world, um, even though the world you're writing you know is a different one. So therefore, you have to ha kind of treat this fine balance of 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 okay, yes, given the state of of the world you're creating, gender will occupy a different kind of a space. But you, at the same time, can't be ignorant of the salience it has in your world, um, and that treading of the line was was one of the big challenges, um, you know, uh, that that I faced and continue to face as I work on the sequel. I mean, that's I mean, to me that, that bit also because you said the material requirement and you know the the conditions that make you know keep the balance in uh, uh, Sumer, given that they can't go beyond the wall and I think can come in beyond the wall and think about population and why it is you know. Then it's called a pure union. Yeah, right. That, that to me yeah. was a great thought experiment in terms of world building. To you know, what, okay, how much of this is material requirement? What happens, you know, when these uh, material uh, restrictions don't arise? So you know, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it is a good thought experiment. So in that sense, you know, part two couldn't come sooner. <laughs> I agree. Seriously, seriously. Like the moment I closed the book, I was yeah. like, I need the sequel now. Like right now, I need to know. In, 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 in any, uh, uh, any idea, got them any predictions on when that's going to be out? Oh yeah, no, no. It, it, it's so I'm, I'm. I, the draft is done. I'm in. I'm in edits right now. Uh, wow. Uh, it, it'll, uh, it, it'll take about two and a half, three months more to to finish, finish, and, and hand it over to the editor, and it'll be out middle of next year, like like this one. So. So lovely, lovely. Normal, normal sequence where one one year and then the year after. So so, it, but it, it, the, the draft is done. Uh, I know how the story ends, <laughs> and and I'm in the presence. So I'm process of editing it right now. So yeah. What does one have to do for sneak peek at draft? Just to figure out the story, how it goes. <laughs> I mean, I mean how, I, are you are you can, corruptible? Easily corruptible? We can, we can, we can, ARCs. We can discuss that offline. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but at, at, at this point, I think we should also tell all the people who are participating that listen, don't. It may be a nice thing. We are impatient, but don't wait for the book second book to come out to pick up this one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You'll anyway want to read this book multiple times. So by the time you know you finish doing that and you've like digested it and got all the uh, innuendos and all the lovely detailing in it. Yeah, then yes. it, that'll be just right time for you to get to book two. So no, 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 start now if you want to be out, thank and, you, you know, you. fully yes. there in time Absolutely. for book two. Absolutely, and because the there's that, so much to think about. Yeah, no, and, and given the fact that it's so ideas heavy, and you know the way it uses the sort of Socratic method to arrive at you know so many things, you know, <clears throat> it's like in a, a bit like a Christopher Nolan film. You know, it only makes sense the second time you watch. <laughs> 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 there, are, there, are, there are there are many Easter eggs scattered all over the all over the book and uh, exactly so yes. you know on your second run once you sort of done and digested and formed your own opinions and then you go back to sort of cross check okay take take no take no take no take <laughs> <laughs> like, like like they say you know you know no man can cross a river twice river twice yeah, you yeah, go yeah. back the the person has changed and the river is different it's it's a it's, it's a bit like that yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. True. It is. It is quite a deep book. Uh, actually, I think now is a great time to get to the readings. So, uh, and okay, usually it is the author who reads from their own work, but um, I've learned from experience and from a trick from my friends that it's very nice for the author to listen to their work being read out. So, what we're going to do is that Krishna and uh, Shanoi are going to pick up uh, some excerpts from the wall and read that uh, out. And also tell us why they picked that particular expert. Like, why did that uh, excerpt, why that uh, resonated with them so much? Uh, Krishna, can you begin with you? Sure. Sure. Okay. So, uh, hang on. Old age, excuse me. Yeah. So, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be reading from, well, not about middle, one third of the book. And 
Let me read this first and then I'll talk about it. Because <laughs> I, I actually I had a tough time choosing. I, I had three narrowed down and then I decided this has to be the one. So uh, the, the chapter is called A Voice in the Dark 2. And what of the dreamers themselves? What about their lives, their own stories, their loves and their longings? What brought them to the fireside and bound them there? Smara, of course, in part. But Smara can't be the entire explanation. There was something else. And I think I know what it was for each of them. But it wouldn't be appropriate to dwell on, dwell on Garuda and Dhara, would it? The one inspired, the other brooded, but history seems to have blotted them from its pages. Mithila then, the younger sister, the one who remained behind with Garuda gone, the one who always longed to be like Garuda, but could never quite manage it. The one who never stopped blaming herself for what happened. You know, I remember playing a game with Mithila once, we were imitating a style of conversation we found in the pages of the philosopher Temur to get at the truth. One of the conversationalists played the role of a questioner and the other answered. The questions had to be asked as swiftly as possible and the answers had to be instinctive, unplanned. To cut a long story short, I was the questioner and because it was Mithila, naturally the theme was the war. I put to her all the reasons that one could have for wanting to reach the wall. Was it for glory? No, she said. Did she dislike the people of Sumer? No. Did she want gain, resources, power and control? No, no, no. Why then, I asked finally, did she want to breach the wall? In three words or less, Mithila, I said. Because it exists because it exists. That was all. That was Mithila. She couldn't give you a coherent reason for why she was doing what she was doing. Why, despite what happened in the pit, she fought and succeeded in keeping the group together, carrying on, carrying on after Dara, carrying on in the teeth of the Shorten's enmity, the elders' hostility and the select's indifference. You would have stubborn re reasons to account for such intransigence, such suicidal stubbornness, wouldn't you? No, not for Mithila. As long as the wall existed, she was driven by this discontent she couldn't identify, by a restlessness that she couldn't name, by the fire that burned within and burned her up, but a fire she could not ignite in others. She didn't have the words or the song, but she had it all inside her. Yeah. Um, and I chose this because, you know, it's, it's, this is one of those, uh, most of the scenes had Mithila in them all the time. Um, and this was this one scene where it's almost like looking outside in at her. And it's, it's, it's a sudden, uh, different less level of resonance it gives with this character as well as why she's doing because I, I, I went through that and, and that's what I, what, the one thing I really liked about this book was the character arcs. There are times when I've actually been pissed with her. They're like, what are you mm -hmm. doing, woman? You know, are you, are, you, are you like mad? This is not done. And then her sister says that to her a lot in the book. And I'm bad. And like, seriously, are you mad? Are you stupid? Can't you see what's going on? I mean, I can figure that out. And I'm just, I'm just reading this book kind of thing. But to me, that speaks to how invested I was in her and in the other characters and in the story. So this particular passage, it was almost like, um, it was almost making sense of Mithila to me. It was almost like, you know, someone was trying to get my head in place about this character where, uh, you know, and then that's it. After that, it's like, I'm completely, I mean, till then I was really, really interested in her, but by then I was like totally invested in her. And um, I love that. It's, it's actually, uh, I stopped halfway. It actually goes on to describe two more characters uh, in the core team, so to say. And I think uh, those differences are also brought out uh, very beautifully, each of their nuances and how they come. But just keeping an eye on the time, I'm going to stop here and make it a short piece if that's okay.
No, I agree with you, Krishna. I mean, um, I loved uh, that particular passage. Actually, I loved all of those uh, voice in the <laughs> dance. I kept looking yeah. forward to them. Because, and you know, they, is, they like turn you're... the camera around and show uh-huh. us Mithila from somebody else's point of view. And they, they, that those are just amazing. Um, yeah, and, 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 and Gautam has a smug smile on his face which says, I know who that is and you don't. <laughs> <laughs> And you can be grateful for social distancing so that you're not actually getting punched. (laughs) Or or maybe that that says, you know, I have the reader exactly where I want them. (laughs) Gautam, as a reader, can I just say, I almost hate you. (laughs) I mean, I love you, but I hate you, if you know what I mean. I mean, like, hate you for leaving me hanging this way. Yeah, I mean, (laughs) no, I mean, I... I guess I guess that's 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 what it also loves to hear actually, um, and um, but no, I'm, I'm I think that it's very really interesting you brought this up because um, one of the things that that I wanted to um, really ensure with, in in the story was that uh, Mithila's opponents should have arguments that are at least as good as hers, mm-hmm. um, and so one should never really be quite sure whose side one is on in that sense. I mean, of course, there is a protagonist and. In that sense, like her story is, is the story, uh, but I think that that um, that one thing that that um, I think the old canon did a little too easily was um, was give us answers about what is, is who is in the right and who is in the wrong. Um, I just felt that that it was important to 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 say that that uh, actual life is 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 much is much is much messier, um, and so. She has her reasons to want to go beyond the wall, but there are reasons not to, and and it's not that her opponents are caricatures or villains or, or cartoons. You know, I mean, they have convictions, um, and so there are times when she would, if, if a reader feels that she's actually being being an idiot or like you know, then that's actually good. Like that, it, it, that's it's a good response because um, part of it is that 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 you know, um, this is not a choice that is meant to be clear cut at any point. And her opponents are not all bad people, you know. It's not like you sit yeah. out hating them. You actually, you, I, I, I kind of like some of them, and I kind of found them really classy. And so even I'm like, you know what? Maybe you just might be right. I mean, why is this girl so insistent yeah. on doing this? So that 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 conflict is something I think that's come across very clearly. So yeah, well done on that. That's beautiful. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad of that. If that if that worked, yeah. Thanks. It did most certainly. Absolutely. Shanoi, uh, would you like to do your reading now? Uh, yeah, uh, a bit Sorry, of one second. Can I just can I say one second for that? I see the question, and I'm so glad because someone's finally spotted that uh, there is a conversation in the book that matches Tears in the Rain from Blade Runner. Is that an mm-hmm. Easter egg? Yes, yes, and and that's the first person who has like I think said they spotted a Blade Runner reference, and that that was one of my uh, things closest to my heart. So I'm so so I'm like I'm really happy that someone has spotted the Blade Runner reference. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I spotted Tolkien reference. Did it there are many. There are many. There are many of the. I know. It's like. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I I guess you know after uh, part two is over, some you know we should just bring out the annotated wall. <laughs> I know <laughs> it's like full <laughs> yes. <this> thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And also, I think that I don't know if we've had uh, something like this in India before where, you know, fans are discussing Easter eggs and fan theories and stuff like that. I don't know if we've had a book like that before, but I think this is awesome because I I just love it. I mean, just the depth of the world building and the the detailing in the sort of writing, especially when he spoke of the Blue Revolution and the boards and stuff like that. It's a sort of nice insight into how an author does world building. You know, it's like the half the things don't make it to the page. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And am I overreading or overseeing the uh, the possibility of an Asimov reference in there too? Um, there, there, there is uh, there, there are there are Asimov references. Uh, in which will, which in will fact, become... the voice in the darks. Uh, no, so the, the voice in the dark is not an Asimov uh, reference. Okay. Um, because so so I got the idea from the voice in the dark from uh, my name is Red. Um, where, ah, okay. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah, so 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 where every chapter was like a different perspective and kind of was looking out onto the story. Uh, so one chapter would be I am your uncle. Second chapter would be like I am so and so. So so, mm-hmm. so that that um uh, uh so that the voice in the dark series was was basically inspired by my name is Red. Uh, okay. There are some references, but but they will they will become clearer in book two. So I want to just hold off on that for now. So yeah. Okay. 
and there are leguin references also I well well, well leguin is 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 yeah <laughs> There's so many. We we should tick them off all one by one. Maybe yeah. Next. Yeah, we'll have a competition. Who spotted maximum uh, <laughs> Easter eggs and references? Yeah. 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 And the but reader will get to get advanced copy of part two. No, I think the <laughs> So sorry, Shanoi, I was interrupting you. Sorry. No, 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 she's no, she's right. Uh, so my reading. No, I. The, okay, there are just a bit of a preamble before that. Uh, so there, there. There are two kinds of authors, right? Uh, one is the uh, Tolkien, you know, when, you know, who went to death saying, "No, Lord of the Rings is not an allegory or a metaphor for, uh, uh, you know, World War One. It's not an allegory. It's not a metaphor. It just is." Then there's the other kind of author, like a C.S. Lewis, who's like, "If you do not get the fact that that big lion is Jesus, I will kill myself." <laughs> Right, so Arslan is the metaphor for Jesus. You know, uh, I agree for that. So I don't know which uh, of these uh, uh, Gautam falls into, but to me, the wall <laughs> sort of so there's a metaphor for the sort of you know gradual losing of things. You know, the you know one by one you lose a few things. Uh, you know, and you're only left with sort of memories. Uh, you know, of them and the sort of living with the loss. becomes the new normal right i mean if you take the wall as you know as the box that you've been put into and it's shrinking further and further so in, in that sense the 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 concept of smara to me in the book i mean these people are living in their mandala hierarchies and you know uh, uh, as much as they would like to think that it's all hunky dory you know things are bubbling to the surface right people are wanting to go out and how the thing of uh, uh this smara the concept of smara uh, you know drives not just mithila but appeals to a lot of people uh and the thing i mean to those who have read the book uh this is for you uh so uh one is by uh this extract is an epigraph from uh, uh before uh chapter 1 of uh, part 1 and it about this concept called smara the passage of time drove us to accept the wall among the natural order of things after all we had no choice and yet there were moments as children we had dreams dreams in which we saw things we could not name or understand we knew on we only knew they existed existed beyond the wall as we grew these dreams and the memories began to fade the vanishing marked a passage into adulthood or so we were told but they never disappeared entirely something was left behind a longing that remained with us every waking moment some days it was too much then we went to the wall looked up at the sky and beat our fists against that smooth black thing caged <laughs> we wept smara they called it the yearning the yearning for a world without the wall now this is an extract by taraf uh, who's uh, one of the people mentioned and it's from his book called unchained history so smara is this sense is yearning but then we come to the other side of the you know divide uh, which is the sort of the antagonist shurtans who say you know this is the one true book and this the book is the black book and this is an extract from the black book and this also talks about smara for malan's transgression the wall of sumer came to be and we who had betrayed the builder's trust were condemned to praya the penance on this side of the wall but it was not enough for the wall to exist because we humans are forgetful and so the builders gave us smara an ache that we carry within us from birth to death an ache that recalls all that we had and all that we lost with the transgression capital t when the circle of time is complete when the penance is over penance is over and when the wall crumbles to dust that day smara too will vanish like the moon at wall rise until then it is a burden to bear so the same concept of smara is in one sense yearning in on, on the other it's a burden mithila gives it her own meaning which i will not say for uh, you know uh, spoiling the book but i loved how the same thing you know means so many different things to so many different people and how the same concept can be sort of you know if you can say weaponized to oppress or be a liberating force depending on which side of the fence and how you interpret it you know so 
that's that's why i chose it so you know if gautam can shed more light about smara i mean it's sort of one of those untranslatable words perhaps like the portuguese saudade you know so like it's nostalgia it's yearning it's it's a lot many things you know and you, you got to feel it was was that the intention i mean it, given that it's one of the fundamental concepts and driving forces of the protagonists yeah i mean that's exactly right and and um, so language has been something that has fascinated me for years and years and um and uh, in sense of of the relationship between language and the world how language constructs the world um you know and and how the world acts upon language all of those questions so of course and i i and so when i was again world building one of the fundamental things was that okay first of all when you have this wall and you never been beyond that your language will be cramped and and you know there are there are things you wouldn't have words for um because there are things that you never you never seen and so your your language itself would be like much spare much more austere uh you know and it, and it would get constricted um, that's one thing the second is that that you would have certain kinds of 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 feelings um that specifically are drawn from the fact that you are surrounded by a wall and never been beyond that and you would need to have different words uh to describe them uh and so swara comes in as this you know in the beginning as this this feeling of longing that you have when you spend all your life surrounded by the wall you know um there is a specific unique feeling that gives you that nobody else would have if they weren't in that condition um so so that was where the idea of it came from and of course the second thing was therefore that there will be a constant battle over words like this when you have these words that are the organizing principles of your existence and there's a constant battle over what they mean and are they you know are they good are they bad is is smart a good thing is the bad thing is something that you are meant to overcome or something that you know you're meant to to live in because you're paying a penance for something you know in again in the book there's theories that people are paying a penance for the crimes of their ancestors which is why they are they within this wall and smart is kind of a reminder of those crimes right so 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 people who want to keep everyone within the wall would try to give a meaning to smara that would justify or this that 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 outcome because this is a feeling everybody has the question is what do you do with that and the language you use for it and the meaning you give to it would, would depend on what you do with that and so there is so part of the one of the main themes of the book is a struggle over language uh, and the struggle to define what these these concepts mean uh, and thereby to to justify the wall continuing to exist sort of justify attempts to go beyond it which finally you know kind of play out in the question of are you allowed to do this are you not allowed to do this and so on so i think at 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 the heart of it and you're right um loss is is a fundamental you know uh running theme that combined with this battle over language and how it shapes our perceptions of the world was central to this conceptualizing of of the idea of smara I mean, I mean, what I also like is how how language sort of plays a, a role in the war. I mean, it's like like you said, you know, that what you call linguistic relativity or the Sapir-Whorf yeah. uh, hypothesis. Yeah. You know, I mean, at at its most fundamental thing, it's like it says so. You know, right here, like imagine a horizon. I can't because they they don't you know they don't haven't seen a horizon. They don't know what a horizon is. You know, and the way they struggle to give you know try to figure out what a horizon is and you know. and all these little all, all those words so that to me was also fascinating you know in terms of the the world building of the wall yeah sapir wharf is good you worth it up because that was one of my earliest fascinations and i, I realize now that that um that uh, that theory is is probably wrong uh, but there there is a fantastic book called the language game uh, no no not, not language game sorry uh, through the language glass uh, by by guy dusher and he begins with this uh, this famous example of the greeks um who had who had a homer's iliad had a phrase called the wine dark sea um and and he says that look whatever else the sea looks like the color of wine is not what it looks like so how is homer saying the wine dark sea like what is the connection between the sea's color and 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 wine wine and then dusha goes on to explain that in your color spectrum if you if you named colors differently and and divide the spectrum differently you can see how the sea's color and wine are on the same spectral line uh if you just classify it the spectrum differently uh and i the book is amazing and i would recommend that but this whole sense of of language is a way of categorizing the world and then as an impact on how you see it and understand it 
it was something that that is just like one of the fundamental basic ideas un- underlying this book as well and 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 you'll see it in in book 2 there's going to be a lot more of that uh yeah okay he's just making us more impatient <laughs> <laughs> It's <laughs> everything with in book to in book to and I'm like <laughs> This is not done this is not fair Yeah <laughs> I protest Yeah I protest <laughs> Absolutely yeah Any I think I think we're uh, kind of uh, getting close to the end uh, of our time so before we get into the audience uh, Q&A because I'm sure they're impatient I just have one more question that I'd like all of you to weigh in on uh which is that uh, gotham spoke at the beginning about the need for uh, infrastructure uh, to you know kind of build up uh, indian sff so coming back to that a bit um what do you think is the future for indian sff and uh, what infrastructure do you think we need uh, you know not just to uh, encourage new readers to pick up books but also to encourage upcoming writers and uh, you know more diverse voices from within india into the field hello ah <laughs> <laughs> i was not sure if i was being heard <laughs> shall we do this in all alphabetical order of last name um anyone who wants to start <laughs> I, i mean I, i guess i can i can since so nobody else i can i can briefly go first on this um um yeah i mean so uh, honestly the the experience i've had working with strange horizons the magazine for the last four years um and and publishing this book in india is that essential to all of this is a, is a community a community of readers a community of writers a community of editors um com- for for community to form you need spaces uh these spaces can take different forms they can be book clubs like this one it's very important they can be magazines like the mithila mithila review uh which is i think at this point the only regular science fiction magazine run out out of india they can be cons conventions which are all the rage in the us and in in the uk but don't yet properly exist over here all those become spaces where communities form uh and and, and that and without that it's not going to happen so so that so i think we need to build over time towards that kind of a of a community uh so that someone who thinks about writing you know is uh, someone who's interested in in specific first of all i mean the, the journey i had right for 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 since the age of 10 i was a fan so i i spent i spent 16 years 16 years as a, as a fan four years as an, as an editor and then now as a novelist I think that's a very typical journey of a science fiction writer. You always begin as a fan, you spend many years as a fan, then you you become a writer. But when you are when you are a fan, you need to see how you can progress to becoming a writer if that is where your interest lies. I never saw that when I was a fan. It happened finally, but I never saw what the root was. Uh and I think if you had this infrastructure as as a, as a as a young fan who dreams of becoming a writer, which I did, if you could see up the path right then you would be able to go to go on that and i think all of this is what would help create that that path because still i mean honestly still um my choice to publish with harper collins india was kind of like in that sense it it, it was an is a risky choice because you know uh the choices people normally make is to is to publish with abroad because that's where you get an audience ready made audience i wouldn't say there isn't an audience here but there is like an existing audience over there um and 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 that's why you expect it to kind of make your name and then indians will read you because you've gotten validation from the west right that that's like that's still still the presumption and i'm not saying it's wrong i think there are like good reasons why by people would do that and i wouldn't judge anyone for doing that that is what you need to do if you want to uh, you kind know, of establish yourself but i think that that with all of this we could we could actually then write on our own terms publish on our own terms uh, and not have to look to that path of of getting in from there and back um uh, you know uh, to become science fiction writers i mean okay uh, yeah that's uh, yeah i'm going to speak about it from the non path towards writer perspective just as as, as a reader uh, what i completely agree with gautam when he said that we don't need to wait for validation from the west lot of us identify as sf fans and sf readers and it, almost everybody seems to take the same path in uh right uh, an asimov uh, or a clark or something like that. great i mean whichever works for you some come in via uh, 
you know ligwen and all of those uh, and tolkien and all of because primarily because when you walk into a, a bookstore this is what sort of still greets you right i mean of course george r r martin most, most of them but now that we have enough it's also i feel upon us as uh, readers and as fans to speak about it you know to speak about the books that we love and to talk about it you know even if it means leaving a short review on goodreads or on amazon or sharing it on a social media thing and talking about it uh, a lot i mean the minute uh, you know you get a hold of a western novel like hey i got this you know this support our indian writers and in turn you know like for example if if chosen spirits does really well if the wall does really well then we'll have more and more books of that right it's a bit of a catch 22 situation right uh, the other thing also that we need is uh, a space in the official uh, literary events map so to speak uh, you know which is where i think uh, you know i will give due credit to the bangalore literature festival who probably became the first literature major literature festival uh you know to say that hey listen we're going to have a dedicated sf track right so i mean that was a chance that they were taking so in the first year i mean uh, krishna was a panelist uh, uh, the first year that we had just like two uh, panels and you know there was such you know the when there is an avenue people will come and looking at the response the next year we had almost six to seven different panels including in the children's section with vinayak verma you know yudhan jayaji ratne and all of these people came down from sri lanka we had yen mcdonald coming down from ireland you know it's sort of uh, you know we had indra pramit das we had sukanya venkat raghavan so you know the community just just sort of forms that way but beyond that there's so much uh, this thing of online and i have found from my uh, personal experience that when there is an avenue people will sort of come 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 together like for example just last week somebody was saying that hey with this tbg quiz i think i found my gang and stuff like that and some of them may go on to become authors and writers and all this sort of thing but but at least we starting to come together and we starting to talk about it so you know i, I th- th- it it falls on us as readers as well krishna uh, okay um i i i actually you know totally resonate with and uh, uh, i should actually say gautam thank you for doing that in terms of publishing in india because i think that has been a very very important thing to do and it's you know it's a fact that many readers probably also don't realize that you know a, a lot of writers who are known as indian sf writers abroad probably sell fewer copies than we think they do but they are better known because we always like things that are coming from overseas whether it's you know uh, and i think we still have that attitude especially because we relate indian writing to not very great writing so there's still this whole duality of either it's going to be very lit and uh, you know of a completely different category altogether or it's going to be very bad writing and in between you have well written but very interesting books in the sff realm and people just don't know where to categorize them so i think and and that sort of ambiguity is something that is going to go away only if you know as shinoy also said not only do writers have to say we are going to publish in india first this is our main market but as shinoy pointed out where readers have to come out and they've got to you know be able to say yeah you know what i'm reading this book it's by an indian author and hell it's bloody good as hell and that validation that thing that it's okay you know that you don't necessarily have to draw pasimov and clark's name or liguin's name when you say i enjoy reading sf has to become a thing it's got to become okay to say you know i read this amazing book called the wall it's by this guy called gautam bhatia and man can that guy write yeah. so you know that i think those conversations have to happen a lot more and um you know strangely enough and uh, uh just just for my thoughts on what is actually going to give us this final philip you're not it's going to sound strange but it's actually going to be corona because in two ways one it's because people are going to be like okay these guys are not writing about weird things that we cannot relate to this is your life you can now relate to it <laughs> <laughs> and the second thing that is probably going to happen is we're going to see a lot more media a visual media content coming out in the sff realm simply because now social distancing means everybody's forced to sh- uh, shoot with green screens so suddenly there's like this huge demand for sff uh, scripts of all kind and i think that might suddenly make it the commercial turning point where this becomes you know a force to reckon with i i i think as a craft point we are already there 
you know, we, we are there, we're pushing the envelope every day. I think the readers are already there. Now, it's just the question of what, how are these factors going to coalesce to make it a commercial turning point? And yeah. Right. That, that's quite insightful. Thank you, all of you. That was wonderful. I think, I think let's go to the audience uh, questions now. Um, Pradeep Mohandas has a question for Gautam. Uh, is Pradeep Mohandas here? Uh, can he unmute himself and ask? Or, uh, okay, I I'll just read out the question. Yeah, Pradeep from uh, YouTube, so you might want to read it out. Okay, okay. So Pradeep is asking, what is the role of Horizons in his life? Did Strange Horizons gig play any role in thinking of the role of Horizon, which inspired the story in the wall? Oh, the role of Horizons in, in my life. Yeah, in your oh, life, yeah. and did the, the idea of Horizons, uh, your work with uh, Strange Horizons inspired the idea of Horizons in the wall? All right, no. Uh, well, so the, answer, the second question is no, because um, the, uh, the work on this book began 12 years ago uh, for various reasons. It was suspended many times. Uh, and it finally got done right now, but but the book is much older than Strange Horizons in, in my, as a part of my life. Um, and I think it's a very happy coincidence that, that Strange Horizons, which is in many ways has shaped how I understand um, science fiction, also has Horizons and, and Horizons is a fundamental part of this book. Uh, but no, I mean, the, again, the, the answer that I think is much more internal to world building, um, which is that uh, it's again about how language fascinates me and, and just this sense that um, if you were living in this world, which was surrounded by a wall, you know, on all sides and wherever you went, that you would get to the wall. Something that is, we take for, for granted, which is the existence of a horizon as part of what it means to live in the world is something that people in that world would just find it so difficult to imagine. And just the, the attempt to imagine that would itself be a bit like an act of liberation which is again something that happens in, in the book people keep trying to imagine what what it might how to visualize what horizon would be um and so it was a, that was the kind of driving force for making the horizon as a concept central to uh to to the wall and of course there are broader themes about discovering horizons getting to the horizon how the horizon keeps receding from you even as you go towards it right there's this famous from virgil's aeneid you have that sense of that that far away shore that keeps receding, even as you sail towards it, so you never get to it. So the horizon again, you know, keeps receding as you go. So you never actually reach the horizon. So is the quest for the horizon actually an illusion? So there are all those all those ideas that are, you know, which I think depends on, on how the reader receives them. But central to it was this struggle over language and and how to imagine those things and how to liberate yourselves by being able to imagine them, despite the constraints that are that are kind of around you. Wonderful. Uh, there's a request from uh, one of the um, viewers. Uh, it's not a question, really. It's uh, just that could you share a high, re high resolution map of Sumer? Because it's impossible to zoom into it on the Kindle copy. And I agree because I had this. Yeah, yeah no, no. I've, 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 I've gotten this, this, this comment from a number of people and I've written to the publishers and I, I wrote to them again right now, like literally five minutes ago while I, when I saw this thing that took. I quoted the comment, not, not, not the person who. I just quoted, I said, look, this is a comment. This is what people have said. Many people have said, please can we sort this out? You know? um, yeah. I, hope it's, I hope they find some way and just a high resolution map I could put on, you know, online would put be fine yeah that'll but, be great uh, that'll be good so publishers can at times be you know it might yeah. it, it, it takes some effort to get to get some things that you think are easy to get but they're not so yeah yeah, yeah i think they're always learning he's, he's saying this with his first fiction yeah. <laughs> 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 publishers can be uh, 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 senior senior at a loss of loss for words <laughs> No, it's, it's, it's like between pragmatism and diplomacy, it's like... <laughs> Knowing of him what we do, like, ah, oh, he's searching my no way, come on. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I, as I said, like, it's just, I, what I found often, I guess, I guess a little funny is that you think that this is something very obvious, right? Um, it should be the easiest thing in the world to get a high res map and just, like, put it up. But somehow there'll be, like, a copyright issue here, like a legal issue there and then... I'm not an IP lawyer, so I don't even know what those issues are, right? But there'll be like a whole bunch of things that will require clearance from someone and then from somebody else. Um, and so, and yeah, I mean, I, I've just found that that um, 
that the things that I thought would be very easy to manage somehow are not uh, because of, of the number of, of actors involved in the publishing world around those issues. Uh, so, so that, yeah, uh, but I hope it's possible to sort this out because maps are really fundamental to the genre. Uh, and I, I do yeah. think, and I think my editor understands that. So I hope that, 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 that's, that that's sorted out. I mean, as someone yeah, who, all it's, as someone it's who can it's, only read physical copies, I cannot bring myself to do e-books. As someone who thinks, score one for physical books. <laughs> <laughs> That's a yes, beautiful yes. looking book, huh? Seriously, it's like yeah. I couldn't get the physical the copy here. Like I could only get my hands on a Kindle, really quick. Oh. That's what I did. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so anonymous question from YouTube: Are there any specific books that uh, you read? I think this is for you, Gautam. Any b- specific books that he read? that he can share that provided insight into the lived experiences of transgender queer women, which helps you provide representation re- respectfully. Right. I mean, so um, transgender, no, but, I mean, and, and I've, I've not uh, in, 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 that's an issue of representation that I, I presently do not think I'm equipped to address. Um, and, and, and that's not uh, in the book and that's, a, a, that's, a lack of, of the book and and but, but I, I I I felt I wasn't equipped to to address that yet and hopefully in the future I will be so so that so that's on, on the issue of, of, of transgender representation um, on the issue of, of queer representation well I mean uh, I guess I mean that other life in the, in the law comes in at, at some point um, and and uh, because of, of of engagement with um, with with the law around um, around this issue, uh, books like Covering by by Kenji Yoshino, uh, the history of, of same sex love in uh, love in India book that we cited in, in in the court case things like that. So there were there were books of that kind and and just like a lot of scholarly literature around around courses in law schools around um, you know the legal frameworks of gender and sexuality. So a number of of, of articles um, in in um, in scholarly journals whose names I can I can send later on. Uh, but what I want to say is that that was secondary. That was that was an understanding of theory. Um, at best, you could have a competent understanding of, of queer theory through, through that. Uh, that is still not going to, I think, and, and just reading about it is not going to um, enable you, I think, to, to do justice to uh, experience, which is why, for me, the irreplaceable bit was sensitive, sensitivity reads. Um, and, and that gave me the kind of feedback uh, that I think no article, uh, no book could have get, have given me. So, so I, I, would, I would count sensitivity, sens- sens- sensitivity reads um, and my, my friends and my, my colleagues who read um, specifically those portions and explained to me when they were accurate and when they weren't accurate representations of, of their experiences um, in being able to do whatever I finally did. Uh, that was the most important part by far. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Pranavi has a question. Pranavi, do you want to, uh, you know, ask it yourself? A question with reference to uh, Mithila's name. Uh, I think I think Gautam's already answered that. Uh, okay. He said it's because, yeah. So uh, okay. another question that I actually wanted to ask was, uh, I, I'm not sure if I remember this right, but there's been a curious lack of fauna in the wall, right? I think you mentioned that as well. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, can you? I found that very interesting and I didn't recognize it up until you mentioned it now. So, why do you think that is, as in within the world, uh, within the rules of the world? Why was it so? Yeah, I mean, so, so that, that, that. Uh, is not a question I can answer right now. <laughs> it, would, oh, it, would be, okay. it would be a bit of a... I'm just going to hold off Spoiler. on that right now. Yeah. Anybody? Uh, okay, no, I was waiting to see if he says book two again. I, I consciously avoided it. <laughs> yeah, I was, was, I was waiting for that. I was like, here it comes, here it comes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but but I mean, so it, what I can say is that um, that I think, I think it is obvious the city within the wall is a constructed system. It's not something that arises naturally. Um, and, and I think what's also kind of clear from, from the novel is that human beings were provided exactly the right amount of resources in the right quantities yeah. to be able mm-hmm. to survive in a decent way. 
you know, not, not like live hand to mouth, to be able to have a comfortable life inside the world. Given the physical constraints, every time you add something to the ecosystem, you will need to add three or four more things to sustain that addition, right? So, so it's basically that it, um, if you have a specific animal, then that animal will need to feed on, on, on something, you know, will need to eat something, you'll need to have that specific crop or, or the other animal that exists and so on. So the more you add, um, the more you will need to add to make it a functioning ecosystem. And so I think the, the challenge in, in not my world building, but within the context of the novel, the world that was built, the world that was somewhere, um, was that in that physical space that is limited, what are the least amount of things you can, you can put in to ensure that human beings can live? Um, and, and, it, and to the extent it was possible to do, to do that without, without fauna, it was done. Um, it, again, because fauna would need to have space and so and space is like a huge constraint, right? So, so it's basically given this small space, what, is, what are the minimum number of things you can put in to ensure that, that life goes on, um, human life goes on. And that was um, what was put in finally. Uh, why that was so well, as I said, that is something that, that uh, cannot now be answered. <laughs> They're all vegetarians. He so who I, I shall not be named. I tried wrangling some info about book two, but well. <laughs> yeah, they're, all, they're, all, they're all vegetarians. By, by, by default, they're all vegetarians. Yeah. Okay. Nemo has a question for Gautam, and this is from uh, YouTube. Uh, how did the book cover come about? And are you open to new designers for book two? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if Nemo is someone I know because I, 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 that question is a very question is a question I've heard very recently in a very specific way. But um, I don't think uh, so, yeah. I, I wonder if Nemo is someone someone I know. Anyway, uh, the, the book cover. Yeah, there was a cover designer. Uh, they asked me what I wanted to represent on on the cover. Uh, so I I said you know I I give them a rough outline and then they gave me some options and this was the one that after consultation. Uh, I, I decided upon. Now, uh, I know that the cover seems to have really polarized, polarized opinion. Um, there are some people uh, who have who think it's very good, and there are some people who detest it. Um, <laughs> uh, there's, there, there are people who have said that a more minimalistic cover would suit the book better. Um, and and uh, and absolutely, and, and I kind of, you know, uh, I guess for book two, I would be thinking of something much more minimalist, and I have a sense of what I want for book two. Uh, but yeah, I'm definitely open to 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 uh, a completely different design that is actually, you know, more on the lines of cover of The Handmaid's Tale or or you know, things like those books where where I mean, there's like one core idea that's conveyed in the cover and and it's you know that's it. It's not like it's not meant to be visually overwhelming, but just like very very spare. So I think that might suit the the mood maybe better. And so so yeah, I'm I'm, I'm thinking about that and and um, uh, and, I, and and someone. Did a, did a delicious rendition of, of a possible cover on Instagram, which I just loved. So, so um, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm really open to, to, to that idea. And I'm totally in that minimalist camp. If you can make it happen, nothing like it. Yeah, yes. I think I, 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 see all the people whose judgment I really trust have gone down that route and, and you're the latest one. So, so, um, so I, I think the, the, the push for that is becoming overwhelming and, and difficult to, to, um, to avoid now. So yeah, it'll probably go down that route, I think. Wonderful. I'm in a minority, but I like, love the cover. <laughs> but my, my, my mom likes it, so. Okay, I said it. I said it. <laughs> okay, I'm going to pretend. Uh, I'm not sure how to feel about that bit, so I'm going to pretend I didn't hear it. <laughs> well, no, I, I trust my mom's judgment. So in, ah, that, okay. yeah. in that sense. All right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So, so just to, like, my mom used to be a filmmaker and, and so like design is wow. something that, that is like really really like something central to to her and, and she and she actually designed the cover of, of the previous non-fiction book so so yeah in that sense oh. yeah yeah that's wonderful Lovely. Uh, I don't think we have any more questions from the audience so and we have actually run over time quite a bit right <laughs> So yeah. I think I think we'll uh, I think we'll close this uh, for now, and uh, yeah, and and until inside, I'm sure we'll be back soon with uh, something great because this has been fabulous. I really loved uh, this. Um,
thank you to everyone who attended the uh, session today i hope you all enjoyed it and that you will pick up a copy of the wall immediately you know don't wait for book 2 please um thank you <laughs> thank you so much thank you so much this was this is wonderful thank you gautam thank you krishna thank you shanoy it was really great uh, interacting with uh, all of you this was wonderful um thank you pranavi uh, we could not have curated this so well without all your contributions um thank you zainab and hasgeek for hosting us and getting us all together um thank you also to anand philip pratiksha and the bangalore uh, sci-fi club for your support um so have a wonderful weekend everyone and and thanks to you vijay lakshmi you. for such a wonderful job of holding this whole thing together thanks, thanks so much thank Could you could have done it without thank you, you. So much. shepherding the session and you know yeah thank you yeah. <laughs> it's like thank you and this is great guys zainab back to you um all right i think uh, we said thank you uh, so there is no more thank you but uh, yes uh, looking forward to next month session i think there is already one plan to uh, to do satyajit trays uh, work on science fiction and uh, uh, yeah and in the middle of all this uh, pranavi and i have cooked up a session on uh, geeking about cheese so uh, just a quick plug for those of you who are up this sunday uh, uh professor subodh das is going to talk to us about water molecules and uh, and fat molecules and how your microwave oven is a fantastic device for your kitchen and your food science hacks so from science fiction to food science learn how to make a chocolate cake in 9 minutes on sunday uh, again joining from the united states uh, just like we are doing right now uh, and you are willing to help us some more um, uh, we are looking forward to more uh, geekery and more watering holes So here's the fans and here's the fiction. And uh, on that note, good night. I have a good weekend. Thanks, everyone. It looks like nobody's really willing to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you can continue talking here if you want. After party, after party. This is so fun talking in general about the wall. It's like okay, chalo, some more time, you know. Oh God. I thought, I thought the person who kind of owns the Zoom kind of account kind of like kicks everyone out, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's that's that, that was my. I thought yeah, that, was going to be yeah, that would be the AV team or that would be me. <laughs> the AV team obviously is afraid because they get a salary from me. <laughs> okay, yeah, I think people are still discussing about uh, uh, the science. Club has published a book. Anything else? Which is a book that the Bangalore Sci-Fi Club has self-published? No. Uh... Okay. Okay. I think there are people discussing that on YouTube right now. But anyway, yeah, I think generally people have been chatting about how this session has been good. Oh, on on the on the on on YouTube or? No, no. This is on Twitter and all over. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm glad if it went well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Adam, you're saying. Oh, it's really a bit, man. I mean, unlike. <laughs> Unlike the residents of the wall, we have an option to leave. <laughs> <laughs> See, we can leave. That's why we don't want to. <laughs> I just told Nitila that you know, like, hey, listen, you want to go? Go. And then like, no, I will not go. I'm a contrarian. No, I'm not going. Why don't you idea. want to go? Because I can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, please, 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 please go. I won't because I can't do that too. <laughs> I should I should explore this this theme a little more maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but uh, seriously, I mean, I'm just waiting for you know book to the way it's it's just sort of ended. You know, the, the last bit just sort of like full, you know, climax, 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 action. Mere se kya break ke baad. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, no, I mean, too I, I long the break. Like too much long the break. Seriously, um, much quicker, but but edits are like a pain, and and um, and there are a lot of them. I've 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 gotten a lot lot of edits, so so I've, I'm like I'm I, yeah yeah like um, line by it's line by line uh, stuff, and and it's just like I mean, just joking. Don't rush it, please. I mean, I know you want yeah till something yeah. that you like is out there. So yeah, yeah. <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah. Taken 12 years for the first one. <laughs> well, 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 well. I mean, much as I want to say, take your time. I also want to say, please don't take too much time. Huh? No, 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 no. The 12 years thing was because I think for the longest time I was, I, I guess, like um, um, the other, uh, the other world to go, the other world to go, and I'm not letting it happen again. Like there's something that will happen uh, again. So, so yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can get that. Yeah, but once you have the taste of, of doing it, I think like kind of then 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 you know you're you're in it. So and you you'd know that. So yeah. <laughs> no, and to, to the point where I could not go could not go back to writing anything that was nonfiction again. You know, had to leave academia, had to leave everything because it's like you know what the hell am I writing? This is boring stuff. I could be writing much more exciting stuff. So 